Okay. Uh, again, as, as Robert said, this is like our fourth or so in a series. Uh, again, not quite design specific, um, but it, it came up, we mentioned it in one of the earlier briefs about just use of PowerPoint in, in terms of communication uh, tool. And the fact that at some point during the, the war game process, you're either going to be using PowerPoint most likely as part of a, one of your planning conferences, um, in briefing the players, trying to outbrief your results. Uh, and, as, and as I said in the, the intro material that Robert's now, um, you can have figured out cold fusion and be able to solve world hunger and you're gonna kill it with bad PowerPoint and, you, and your message is gonna get lost. So due to the ubiquitous of PowerPoint, um, that's why I, I kind of put this together. Uh, and so without further ado, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll again, as uh, we'll start to share the screen, um, it's the usual kind of uh, ROE here in terms of, uh, we'll take questions at the end. This usually typically goes for just about an hour. And I'll start with our usual disclaimers in terms of, again, this is all my stuff. I don't expressly represent the Navy, the War College or the federal government. Um, uh, this actual, this part uh, is, this brief, I should say, it was part of a three hour evening course that I used to teach at, uh, at Salve Regina University. Um, and it had two major parts, um, a part on the representation of statistical data and then putting that in the context of PowerPoint. Um, so we're gonna be more PowerPoint focused uh, as a visual communication medium uh, in this presentation. If some people have some interest in the how to lie with statistics graphically, um, we, can, we can talk about that uh, at, a, at another point or make that as a, an add on activity. Um, again, I, I rattle on for about an hour. We'll try to make sure we hold about 30 minutes at the end for Q&A. And uh, again, we are recording this session. I'm gonna make one quick change here. Make sure that, okay, there we go. And we'll press on. So, better visual communications. Um, this, this brief goes by lots of names. Why is your PowerPoint so bad? It's not PowerPoint's fault communications with PowerPoint, uh, et cetera. It, it's really about, not about picking on PowerPoint per se, although I will do that at, at one part of it. I am gonna pick a little bit on, on where I do blame PowerPoint for why you end up with what you end up with. Um, but by and large, this is more about how to effectively communicate from a visual perspective. Uh, PowerPoint tends to be the tool that everyone uses, um, so it'll be put in that context, but it really is more about uh, making sure that we communicate effectively. Love it. So with that lead in, we're going to get in the way back machine. Okay. Um, we're going to go back in time. Uh, as a species, we've been communicating visually for about uh, what well, millennia. Oldest cave paintings are about 64,000 years old. And so uh, we are a creature that communicates through picture and story. Okay? Now, our ability to project the story, uh, to project imagery is really only about 200 years old. Okay? Um, and it begins with something called the magic lantern in the 1800s. Uh, and this is the forerunner to the film strip. Okay? We're basically uh, images painted on glass were slid past a light and projected onto a screen, uh, often accompanied with music and, and, and story. But this is the beginning, so it's the 1800s, all right? Then we get to the 1900s, and it's the, it's the silent film. It's moving pictures, all right? It's the introduction of the motion picture. It dominates the early part of the 1900s, and then we go from silent films to talkies, okay? The uh, classroom of the 1950s or later, all right, if you're a certain age, you may remember the opaque projector. These were huge clunky things, threw off a ton of heat. Um, but you could take a piece of paper or a map, something, uh, and slide it on the tray underneath and project that image to your audience, typically your classroom, all right? Uh, then we had, and then introduced in the 1960s, the ubiquitous overhead projector and transparencies. And this showed up in every classroom from kindergarten through colleges uh, as a way to project materials, either pre-prepared slides or 
just the handwritten stuff that you, were, you did right on a transparency on the on the surface there. But kind of the 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 granddaddy of all uh, projection capability that was almost in every home introduced in 1961 is Kodak carousel projector. Uh, the uh, the top of the projector, if you're, if you're if you're not familiar, this part up here is basically the carousel loaded with slides, and this is the analog uh, uh, precedent to the PowerPoint slide deck. This is your collection of slides. This is what you're going to show, right? And again, it was loaded up with these little 35 millimeter transparent slides that you could then project. And that's accompanied with the little clunky sound as we went from slide to slide. This is how we told our stories. This is how we gathered. Uh, in the living room or the rec room with the curtains drawn uh, and your father projecting this onto a sheet or a screen if you happen to have one, telling stories of the, the, the beach vacation, of, of road trips, family outings, travel, new adventures the family holidays and celebrations and the grand trips and the grand adventures, okay? So PowerPoint held out the promise of being the digital equivalent of our analog film and slide projector, a way to be able to project images, rich images, and to tell our stories and to narrate and pass along information. Uh, what we got instead was this. And, and I've just taken these from examples of PowerPoint briefs that I've seen or had to sit through. And some, a lot of these are from the college. Not exactly what we call grand imagery, ooh, just color here. And, and especially in the military, all right? At some point we decided that, well, we, there's too many slides in your slide deck. We need to condense it. So we thought that, well, if, if I can put four slides on one slide and call it a quad slide, that's somehow better than four individual slides. Of course, if you follow that logic, if a slide of four slides is good, then a slide of quad slides would be better, and quad slides from that would be more better than quad slides and what well, just ad, ad nauseum. Okay, this is stupid. The problem here isn't PowerPoint. The PowerPoint is simply a tool. And everyone adheres this, and everyone knows this intellectually, but we don't react this way. Nobody reads a bad book and goes, oh, that's clearly his word processor. He must have used Microsoft Word because this is terrible. Nobody blames the word processor for bad prose. Any more so than people come out of a bad movie and say, ah, clearly it was his choice of film, or I don't know, maybe it was the projector. But that was just a, that's a, that was a, a bomb. Nobody blames the tools in those cases. But when it comes to PowerPoint, it's the first thing we jump on, is that we pick on PowerPoint. So what is it we can do to start thinking about how we use PowerPoint to more effectively communicate? And one of the first things you've got to separate in your head is that there are two major venues where PowerPoint is used. Uh, and this first venue is of a style that uh, Nancy Duarte calls, uh, and, and Bruce Gabriel, and we'll look at their work here uh, in a bit, is what we call the ballroom style, okay? This is a TED Talk. If you think about a TED Talk, this is the classic quote unquote ballroom environment where you've got a large audience. It's not terribly interactive. It's really kind of that presentation lecture environment where somebody is the center of attention, telling information, and there are supporting visuals potentially uh, being projected around them. This isn't a time for people to study slides in depth or look at a ton of detail in those in situations, all right? Uh, again, it's for the, the large scale, passive on the audience's part, presentation of information. So we'll call it the ballroom style environment or the ballroom environment for the use of PowerPoint, right? Now contrast that with what's called the boardroom style, okay? Much smaller groups, uh, your, your, the people in your quote unquote audience are probably team members, uh, people who have a vested interest in what it is you're presenting or maybe you've made parts of it. 
Uh, this is the environment where we talk about the shared PowerPoint deck. Once upon a time, uh, work groups perhaps would have been working from point papers and executive summaries and other uh, textual-based documents as their collective work product. At some point, it became a PowerPoint deck is what we're collectively working with. But it's just that. It's a, it's a group collectively interacting with material, right? Those are two very different environments for the use of PowerPoint. And the problem typically occurs when someone takes what was meant to be a boardroom style type of material and tries to put it into the ballroom environment. And it doesn't work the other way around very well either, going from ballroom to boardroom. So this is probably our first problem is where we get this mismatch of the environment in which you're trying to use PowerPoint. Uh, bah! Okay, so here's a, here's a classic example of where PowerPoint got blamed, right? PowerPoint got blamed. Right. 2009, a PA Consulting Group put together what's called a K-map. This is an influence map uh, that looks at the Afghanistan uh, insurgency problem at the time. Um, and when this was presented, uh, it ended up in the newspapers with stuff like this. Here, U.S. generals given baffling PowerPoint presentation. Um, Army discovers that PowerPoint makes you stupid. Uh, McChrystal picked on this, and he was going, you know, tongue in cheek. But again, uh, he was he was picking at the slide. Everyone's picking at the slide. We've met the enemy and it's PowerPoint. Nobody is saying, hey, PA Consulting Group, you made something we don't understand. Because that's put it together. No, it's PowerPoint that's getting beaten up. Now, there's a ton of great information in this slide. But when you dump complexity on an audience all at once, they tend to get lost. Bruce Gabriel, uh, and I've mentioned him twice now, so you can tell this is going to be someone uh, influential in terms of thinking about how you're going to make work uh, with PowerPoint better. Um, Bruce Gabriel looked at this slide and said, look, there was a far better way that this could have been presented. Same information, but it could have been more and more effectively communicated. And so what Bruce recommends is taking that mess and says, look, break it down into pieces parts for the audience and put up there kind of the a key thought for each section of that uh, influence map, all right? Coalition support. Highlight the major pieces parts of that. Uh, the tactical support, uh, coalition capacities and priorities, institutionalization, and uh, the domestic support, okay? Then he swings. This is now we could have looked at another portion and focused on the Afghan government. And the key nodes within this region that represent the important relationships as it relates to the Afghan government and its support to the war efforts. Then we've got uh, the, the broader popular support. What are its key nodes? How do those relate? And finally, what about the outside support and insurgencies and how are they impacting things and the flow of narcotics and how that was funding stuff? So by first introducing those four broad areas, big ideas, introducing the next layer down in terms of detail of information, these supporting bullets. And then finally, if you're interested in, in going down into the, into the little bit more of the minutia, um, but when you, when you approach it this way, and now you look at this slide, which just is kind of this overlay to it, it's suddenly not quite this intimidating mess it was before. Same slide, okay, just same slide, but just with a bit of added information. So, the, the biggest problem we have is that we tend to, when we try to commute, vi communicate visually, we're not consciously thinking about what it is we're putting on the slide or how we're doing it. Um, and unfortunately, again, I said, sorry, I don't, I don't blame PowerPoint per se, but some of the Microsoft products tend to lead you down to a pathway where if you don't put some effort into it, you're going to get eh, right? And this is another example of eh, right? This is the classic default Excel graph. So if you had a spreadsheet, filled it up with a bunch of this information here and you threw it then onto a PowerPoint slide. This is what you get. I'm not even sure what this is supposed to be trying to communicate, right? Key verticals focused upon. I don't know what that means. And I got a cacophony of color and I don't get it. I am, when I look at this, I don't get the point, right? And whether or not there's supposed to be a human there explaining it or not, it could have been this. Patient arranged in a way that immediately communicates the big idea at the top. And we'll talk about the big idea and why it is you need to, or how is a better use of the space, the real estate that represents on the slide, and, and the big idea being uh, up and left most in the corner there. But now I get an idea of, oh, this is what he's trying to tell me. And from that graph, I can see the parts of the information I'm supposed to focus on and draw my eye to it. 
right? So already we're just starting to try to see some differences between what you typically get and what you could get. And we'll talk about the underlying principles that get you to what you could. Now, um, this one here, uh, uh, if you're familiar with Ed Tufty, he's a, a visual communications guru, um, and he'll say that this slide killed seven people. And again, if you're scanning, you're you, you probably you're not even sure what this is trying to describe. All right, I'll give you a hint. Sophie is spray on foam insulation. All right. This was the slide that was used by a group of engineers trying to communicate to NASA leadership about what needed to be done about Columbia. On liftoff 2003, Columbia, uh, the, the spray on foam insulation that surrounded the exterior fuel tank, uh, large chunks of it broke off. Uh, larger than it had been uh, ever than it previously been tested. Large chunks of it uh, broke off during liftoff and struck the, the shuttle itself. And it was questionable how much damage she had sustained. So while she was, uh, there was a meeting convened and that slide was what was used to try to communicate just what exactly the problems and risks potentially was. Um, needless to say, uh, you look at that slide and I don't get a sense of, of risk or what same information revision. The point was they wanted more photographs of the wing in orbit. We could have done that, right? And then breaking out immediately at the top of the page, best case, worst case scenario. The three key items that you need to take away from this, Crater, which is a simulation tool that looked at the, the, uh, the foam, what could have happened at foam of different sizes and at different velocities striking, the material of the wing, that's crater, okay? Results were inconclusive and there was a potentially critical damage. And if you wanted to know more, you could keep reading down. Um, you've seen now a couple of slides where there's been what we call the pyramid of information. And this was true, this was back when you were learning, you know, composition in high school. And we're talking about writing newspapers articles. You know how in a newspaper story, a good story is written such that you get 80% of the story in the first couple paragraphs. If you want to know more, you can keep reading and you get more and more detail the deeper you get into the story. But you can pitch it at any time and have at least up to that point that complete story. Pyramiding your information on your slides is going to be something I'm going to come back to a couple of times now, where there's a, a single big takeaway. Typically, we're going to put it at towards the top of the slide. And we'll talk about why, right? Then if your reader wants more, we can get another layer of detail. In this case, you know, the big takeaway is we need additional in-orbit photos of the wing because we've got a worst case scenario that could have penetrated through the aluminum frame, which it had. The next layer of information is crater predicts there could be complete penetration. The results are inconclusive and we get potentially critical damage. And if we want more information, we can go another layer deeper. And now we're down into the bottom section of the slide where we can read about how many cubic inches in the modeling and percentages and velocities, et cetera, right? So kind of teeing up how, if you start to become conscious and, and actively thinking about how you're using the real estate that's laid out for you uh, in a PowerPoint slide, in a default, if you're using four, three, that's seven and a half, you get 750 square inches to play with. I'm sorry, 75 square inches to play with. Um, but again, you can see how it, it's not hard Maybe it's hard, maybe it's not. But, but look at the left and you can see kind of the default stuff that gets produced by these Microsoft versus what you could have. If you put a little effort into it and, and applied some design principles on the right. Now, what I'm not gonna be able to do in the remaining 43 minutes or so is, is to turn you into the Bob Rosses of PowerPoint. Okay, any more so than I can make up the fact that far too many of you dropped out of art class in the ninth grade, all right? This is visual communications and art, which maybe that's how it should have been, should have been taught in high school, not art, because then we tend to, to, tend to think of watercolor and, and ceramics and, and it's all very nice. And I mean, I, my, my art teacher was prototypical of the time period, you know, the, the one guy in the school wearing, wearing Birkenstocks and had the long hair, okay? But when you think of it in terms of visual communications and the power of communicating visually and understanding the fundamentals of visual design, ooh, now it sounds like it might have some more utility other than the kids who just like to draw. So I can't make up for all those years, but I can at least give you some of the principles that go into this. So resources, because I can't cover uh, the, the entire, you know, make this a, a, an art and design course uh, in 45 minutes. Um, so I'm gonna give you resources, okay? 
I've mentioned this book a couple of times now, Speaking PowerPoint by Bruce Gabriel. Uh, Bruce Gabriel is a former Microsoft uh, employee, um, and his book is the book you want to go to if the preponderance of what you're going to be doing and the way you tend to communicate uh, in PowerPoint and in your situations is boardroom. Those small working groups that are using PowerPoint as a, a tool for a group to uh, collaborate over and communicate their work, right? That's speaking PowerPoint, Bruce Gabriel. On the other hand, if you find yourself in the TED talk, you find yourself having to present to large audiences, a large group of, of folks, shareholders, company, employees, et cetera, then Nancy Duarte's Slideology is the book you want. If you have these two books on your library shelf, okay, and all you do is kind of just thumb through them, you're already light years ahead uh, in terms of creating better PowerPoint materials, right? So you jot those down, you go get them, right? Now, uh, PowerPoint in terms of the visuals is part of what we're doing, but often we're trying to use those visuals to tell a story, uh, to pass information in narrative form. And that is the most powerful way we communicate is through narrative, right? People tend to remember a story more than just a dump of a bunch of facts when they're threaded together into a tale, right? Uh, and then why good speakers often will tell that anecdote, that personal story, all right? And as soon as you, if you watch a group of people who are listening to information and suddenly that speaker begins to shift into storytelling mode, people physically lean in a little bit. They tend to perk up a bit because here comes a story and we respond to stories. Nancy Duarte's Resonate is about the power of how to construct those compelling narratives. So you put them together, resonate with Slideology, and you get a pretty powerful package there. Now. Some people, I think a publisher went and said, yeah, but these look too much like coffee table books for artsy fartsy types. So Harvard Business Review took uh, the best bits of Resonant and Slideology and put it all together. Nancy uh, Duarte uh, they authored it. Um, and HBR uh, has a book just on these two topics combined, the Harvard Business Review, which combines both Resonate and Slideology. Finally, probably the biggest the power is knowing when not to use PowerPoint, all right? Uh, Chris Witt. Uh, he's an executive coach and speaking coach, um, and he wrote, real leaders don't do PowerPoint. And again, uh, this wasn't, Chris did not write this to be an anti-PowerPoint screed, okay? He wanted to emphasize that there are so many times when you can be more effective without PowerPoint. And then when you do use PowerPoint, here, again, he puts on some tips if you are going to use PowerPoint, then again, how do we be more effective? But part of this is realizing when you should just walk away and say, no, I don't need PowerPoint. It doesn't add to the power of my message. So these four books, uh, put them on your bookshelves. All right now, other resources you can get pronto quick because they're online, okay? Um, and this is the periodic table of visualization methods. Now, this is an interactive web page, and uh, you can see how they've kind of obviously mirrored the periodic table, but by color, or the types of things you're trying to do, data visualization, concept visualization, and then what you're trying to show within that context, that lower uh, right hand, or I'm sorry, left hand corner, um, structure, uh, detail, process. If you then take and you go to this web page and you take your cursor and you hover over one of these squares, looking at the color and the iconology, it'll pop examples of charts or tables uh, or diagrams that might be an effective way to communicate whatever it is you're trying to do that you landed on that square in the first place. So that's a periodic table of visualization, okay? There's also over at uh, Extreme PowerPoint is this chart suggestion thing, right? Um, they've updated it now. Actually, they've got a combo one, it's even larger. But again, you start in the center saying, what is it you're trying to explain? What is it you're trying to communicate to your audience? Answer some questions, follow your way through, and it might suggest that, well, it sounds like maybe a bar graph. Maybe a heat map, maybe a histogram um, is a good way to represent visually what it is that you have to show. That's over at Extreme PowerPoint, uh, extremepresentations.com. Um, now, color, we're gonna come back on color, right? All right, color is not an arbitrary choice, right? Color um, conveys a sense of unity to your materials. Um, it can excite, it can calm. If you don't know how to work with color, right, and if you don't, not everybody has a color wheel at home, right? Um, but uh, this website over at Adobe 
uh, basically will recommend color palettes for you based on a key image. So I threw in this picture uh, of me and Adobe said, hey, if I were gonna pull a palette off of this, I think these would be a nice group of colors to use, which work together. Ooh, so soothing. All right, this is also important if you're trying to communicate brand. Um, you look at Porsche's materials, okay? Company colors, red, yellow, and black, right? It shows up in everything. Red, yellow, black, because it's reinforcing brand. It's reinforcing the message. Um, along with uh, the Adobe site, there's another one uh, that occasionally I'll use, um, which uses this color designer, where again, depending on how many colors you think you need, uh, two, three, a triad, are you looking for hot schools, complementaries, contrasting, et cetera. Um, we'll look at some places where color choice goes bad uh, in slides. Uh, but again, if you don't have that art background, it doesn't mean you can't learn a little bit about using color. I mean, we all have a, a natural inclination towards color uh, in terms of, you know, you paint, paint a room in your house and you'll find out just, you know, again, the old joke about is it eggshell, ecru, off-white, cream, right? Um, color obviously conveys mood, conveys uh, a sense of, of unity and unifying. And we'll look at an example on how using a color palette can pull slides together. And then lastly, people say, well, I don't know where to get some of these pictures and stuff. I just, you know, I just use clip art. It's like, oh my God. All right, um, the Noun Project, and now with the latest edition of PowerPoint, PowerPoint has a new little insert up on the insert. It used to be, you know, I stick in a picture, insert picture, insert shape. Well, now you've also got insert, insert icons. And there's a whole library of icons inside of PowerPoint all right, of this type of nature. Or you can go to the Noun Project um, and look for imagery here. Uh, because sometimes a nice, simple icon uh, is more impacting than some busy animated clip art thing you, you stole off the internet. So again, resources, the books, some online resources, start building out your toolkit here for how we're gonna use it. Now, PowerPoint tries to help, it really does. <laughs> Inside of PowerPoint is something called smart art, right? Now, smart art can be a little bit of a nuisance to use if you're actually trying to have, you know, you've built a slide and you're trying to use the magic wand and tell smart art to convert and to change it into something better. I just use Smart Art because it's a great place to look at what's already preloaded in PowerPoint in terms of things like process wheels and, and uh, organizational chart uh, and flow diagrams and just go peruse. I mean, look, at, you try it. look, are you trying to show a list? Are you trying to show a process? Over here, if you, you know, it's trying to show you here by giving you some ideas about what you can be looking at. You're trying to show a cycle, okay? There are examples of all these things already in PowerPoint. Now, that's under the smart art section, all right? Now, um, let's just talk about PowerPoint in general and how it sets you up and, and, and what the, my pet peeves about the use of this PowerPoint. So here we go. The typical slide for text that starts as soon as you open PowerPoint, right? So what are the crimes that are gonna be committed on this page, right? The first off is you're gonna feel compelled because there's a box up there to put in some sort of title. Really? Every single slide needs a title? Why? What exactly is that space best used for? I tell you, it's not for a title, right? And the repetitive logos in the corners, all right, also drive me nuts. I blame the military for this. I don't know when we started thinking that putting the command logo or patch or something in every corner and every slide was a good idea, right? So that's about a quarter of the slide, by the way, 23% of the territory. You've got this real estate. You're trying to design and try to communicate the best use of that 75 square inches all right, don't use the, don't waste the top third of it for some stupid obligatory obvious slide title, okay? I can tell what the slide is often. I don't need a title to tell me what it is. It's sort of like if you're gonna use an agenda slide. It's clearly an agenda because you have a list of items on there. I don't have to look at it and go, oh, well, thank goodness he put the word agenda at the top of the slide because I wouldn't have known what this was, all right? Uh, and then the rest of the body. So already it teases you by throwing up a box and once you put a title in there, and again, for some bizarre reason, you'll put logos in the corners, all right? And then the rest of it, it starts to use this bullet format, all right? Again, I don't know who to blame for the bulleting, all right? Because every time you add another layer of detail, what's it do? It gets smaller, gets indented, and it gets another dumb little bullet, all right? Typically, bullets, I'm not going to say bullets are never useful, right? But it's a bulleted list, right? The bullets are meant to help the eye distinguish where one item starts from the next item, okay? If you've got two paragraphs on the page, you won't pick up a book and in front of every paragraph, there isn't a bullet on every page. No, 
We do a little indent, we do a little space. We use other textual techniques to separate information when it's principally text, right? Don't, the, the bullet is just, okay? It, it is an unnecessary little ornamentation out there and, and it encourages you to write an ever decreasing font. Then at some point you'll think, maybe I should throw some color on there. And you'd start arbitrarily picking colors. Now colors are gonna get you into trouble here pretty quickly and I'll show you why, right? Oh, by the way, the footer, if you're wasting the top, you're wasting another 10% at the bottom. Um, at least it's not as bad. Visually putting stuff down at the bottom right is, is less of a crime than, than wasting some of the other parts of the slide. Um, so it is only 10% down there. But again, do you need to put the same thing at the bottom of every slide over and over and over again? Then finally, you'll decide that it, this slide needs to be punched up with some pictures. Okay, so then you'll go out there and you'll start grabbing arbitrary clip art. Remember why it's called clip art? Once upon a time, it was physically on sheets of paper. You clipped a part with a pair of scissors to put and taped onto things and then you photographed it, right? That's why it's called clip art. You clipped it out, taped it to stuff, right? So the problem now with clip art is a lack of unity in terms of appearance, all right? So in this case, you can see, good grief, I've, I've mixed some sort of animated trash or drawn trash can with a photograph of bullets. And why would I do that? I don't know, because you like trash cans and bullets. Don't just arbitrarily pick what's called eye candy or eye ornamentation to sprinkle on your slides for quote unquote visual interest. Worse now is you then you go and decide to put a background on it. Okay, now the color choice is starting to haunt you because certain colors cause what's called scintillation. Right? And makes it very difficult for the color to be, for the words to be read. We'll talk more about this when, when we talk about font selection. And now we discover that you don't know how to remove backgrounds or create transparencies on stuff you've lifted, right? All those white squares behind Mr. Yuck in the upper corners behind my trash can, right? I, there are tools in PowerPoint to remove those. There's the remove background tool uh, and there's the set transparency tool, right? Uh, again, you're trying to portray an image that looks like it's professional. And this doesn't look professional. Now, this type of structure though, oh look, <laughs> it's exactly what my organization did, right? In terms of creating a slide, debrief some visiting folks, um, and here we go. Uh, up at the top, I already, we're already irritated. Uh, there's nothing worse than the title that wraps, whoops, the title that wraps one word down on the lower line. And it's center justified. We call these widows, right? The, the one word that wraps down and looks just dumb, right? Uh, again, if I'm trying to convey information from a pyramid structure, I'm not sure if I glance at this slide, I can't quickly figure out what it's about. And by the way, you are having a hard time reading this slide if you're trying to listen to me because you can't do both. I don't care about multitasking. Multitasking just means you're trying to rapidly switch between activities. You, your brain does not process the two in parallel, okay? You're either reading or you're listening, but you're not doing both. And your audience, your audience has to choose which to do. They'll try to look at your slide, listen to you, listen to you, read the slide, a, a, a crime there, reading the slide to the audience, right? But you're looking at this thing and, and you're trying to think, ah, how could it have been better? Well, we could have pyramided it. Just like we saw with the space shuttle slide, put your big idea, at the top of the slide. It doesn't need a title, it needs a big idea. What's your bluff, bottom, you know, bottom line up front kind of thing. What's the thing I want, if you'd only read one thing on this slide, this was the most important idea that the department was trying to communicate to the visiting people who were seeing this brief, okay? Now, if I want more, there are clearly are two major components, the, the civilian faculty and this complexity. If I want more, that is further broken down for me. If I want more, there's explanatory text. So this is structured in a pyramid, pyramid of information that, that as a reader, I could pitch out at any point and come away with the big idea or maybe a little more or maybe a little more. Same slide, information wise, all right? Presents in a much different manner. So when we're communicating, we can just use words, all right? Here's a slide about human excrement, all right? Delightful slide. Um, communicating in words and numbers, uh, it's 75% uh, water, color, red, stool, usually means you've got lower uh, intestinal bleeding, et cetera, et cetera. There's some information here, interesting. But could we communicate it better? Well, maybe we can start using graphs and charts to help communicate some of this. If we're talking about color and we don't show color, it's kind of like the first no-brainer. It's like, well, if you're talking color, show the color. 
In this case, trying to show that the color of your feces can indicate your health, right? And a pie chart, pie charts aren't my favorite. Um, there's lots of problems with pie charts, but in this case, it works okay to try to give an idea that the big takeaway is it's mostly water. Or, now we've gone from using words to communicate to trying to use some graphs and charts to maybe some sort of infographic, okay? Here we go, know your boot. Same information, now presented in a very different way. Now, I think at this point already, you have forgotten the first slide of the series. And this is the one that's gonna stick with you, the Play-Doh pile of poop. It makes a visual impact, more so than that wall of words did in the very first slide. This is considered like one of the best uh, infographics by the father of infographics, a Frenchman, Charles Menard, uh, developed this uh, to, to illustrate uh, what happened to Napoleon's forces as he marches on Moscow, uh, tries to, to besiege and take, to capture Moscow, and then has to retreat. So the width here of this line, right here, this width represents the number of troops Napoleon had. And you can see as he marches east, he is losing men to the weather, to disease, to battle, and eventually has to turn around and come on back. And by the time he returns, he's down to this little bit right here. That's a pretty powerful visual to understand the scale of loss Napoleon suffers. Contrast that with stuff like this. This is what I call the tortured analogy where someone has something to say about the relationship between teachers and students, I think, and someone said, well, it's kind of like a bike. And it's like, it is? Okay, so now we try to, to make a bike fit somehow. Um, uh, so these are examples where you're, you're forcing the analogy. The diagram, the visual is not adding additional understanding. You're simply now using it to illustrate, but not communicate information about the topic at hand. And it's, it's forced, okay? It's not adding value in terms of the understanding. One of the worst cases was this showed up in USA Today. All right, America's comic book. Down on the lower uh, left-hand front page is often some sort of little graphic, all right? And often the visual portion of it adds nothing to the in communicated. So this one um, raised eyebrows uh, when, and apparently the, the two the people who were responsible for this graphic um, uh, did not have the hand. The first draft of this did not have this arm, okay? It was had a sun and it had the thermometer. And at some point, and even then uh, they, they say, we don't know what struck us, to put this hand holding this raw, it bad. Okay, so, and this is a case where now it's actually distracting from the information trying to be conveyed, where the visual is working against your message, because when you look at it and the puffy cheeks and the sun holding on, you've lost really what it is it's trying to talk about, and it's talking about this danger of a heat wave and potential health effects. Now, I said we're not going to blame PowerPoint. Well, okay, there are parts we can blame on PowerPoint, right, and specifically the way PowerPoint sets you up, okay, when you open it up, it's gonna to wanna to push two slides at you. It's gonna to wanna to push a title slide at you. And it's gonna to wanna to push the first text-based bulleted slide at you, all right? So oftentimes you can't get away with not having a title slide, all right? Because it may convey some important information, who the speaker is, what's the topic, et cetera. So oftentimes, okay, go with the title slide. Um, I would say that in, in some cases, if you can get away with it, don't. Um, that's what people who introduce you are for. Um, People came to hear what you have to say, not figure out who you are. Um, that's in the brochure, that's in the speaker's guide, that's in the literature that was handed out before the conference, right? But oftentimes you can't really escape the obligatory title slide. Okay, then you hit this one, all right? And here we go. I already dumped all over this slide about why I don't like it, all right? Now, the options that you have for slide templates, all right, they come up when you right click a slide and you can pick from. The ones I want you to try to not use, um, the, the title slide we already talked about, you kind of, you got, you're somewhat stuck with that one. So it's got some utility, okay? But the one with the, the title and content, stop it, get rid of that. Just delete it out of your deck. You can't, you can go to your master views and get rid of these. Section header, two none of these are, are terribly useful. 
The blank is awesome. And picture with caption. If you can work with these three, your PowerPoint's probably already better off because of what it compels you to do. And what it doesn't let you do is simply make quick bulleted texts and bulleted lists. And there's nothing to suggest um, that somehow you remember bullets any better than, than actual, uh, you, you remember a full English declarative sentence more than you do bullets. I can give you seven words in a sentence, which will be far easier for you to remember than seven stray words stuck on a slide. It doesn't work, okay? And people say, well, you know, the rules, like uh, no more than four bullets to a slide or four words to a bullet. No, stop it. All you typically then do is take what would have been a great big long list uh, and that you think that, well, I, I can't put uh, 10 things on the slide, so I'll make three slides with three things and an extra one on the fourth one, I hope no one notices. It's no more rememberable. It doesn't make it any more effective than trying to avoid dumping the 10 lists on them in the first place. But these slides, okay, the blank and the picture with caption. Um, the power of picture with caption, and Bruce Gabriel talks about this specifically um, with a company that had, was using basically an early PowerPoint type of format um, to communicate, uh, to respond to uh, government contract proposals. Right? And what they found was by structuring a page where they put the key idea, I know it says title, but you're going to put a key idea. The whole, the reason this page exists is going to go here. You're going to put supporting detail here, a visual that this reinforces. Now, why are you going to put the visual on, on the right side and not the left side? Because if you put the picture on this side, people are looking at something they haven't had explained to them yet. Oh, and then over here, they read about it, okay? Momentary confusion, you've wasted the landing spot. The eye lands right here, okay? That's, this is where the eye wants to land. And you've landed on something you didn't understand. Ooh, not a good start, okay? You'd rather land on your big idea, okay? That's underneath there, right? And then be able to read and go across. Now, obviously, you are using this in a boardroom situation, not a ballroom situation. So again, always keep in mind, are you speaking to the big room or are you speaking to the small room, so to speak, okay? All right, so uh, within PowerPoint, there are some places where it's trying to help, okay? It really is trying to help. One of them is your color selection, right? Again, all right, so you're not a color guru, okay? You're not an interior designer, okay. But PowerPoint already packaged harmonious groups of color for you. It's up, if you go up under the design tab, if you go up here under the design tab and you go all over to this one here and there's a little under these, these little things you're not gonna use by the way, these formatted templates. Um, there's a little more button right here that'll drop down colors, fonts, okay? And right here, you can change the default color collection that you're working from, all right? To something that again is more visually appealing and suits for what you're working with, okay? Likewise, They've already put together some combos for fonts. And we'll talk about fonts here in a moment, right? But this is the idea where certain fonts work, quote unquote, well together. You don't have to be, again, a graphic designer. Um, they've tried to help you out by already bucketing together certain combinations of fonts for use in either title or body, which are potentially more harmonious, that communicate better or easier to read. They draw the eye. They've already done this for you. You just have to know where to go find it. All of this is under the design tab. Go root around in there, right? Now, while we're on the topic of, of text, right? And, and these are extremes because you should never be putting a wall of text on a PowerPoint slide like this, all right? But realize that uh, how you arrange the text in and itself is a visual, has visual weight, right? And this is what we call the ragged edge or the rag edge, all right? And that's the side that obviously this is less justified. So it's nice and straight over there. Your eye likes the straight edge. The eye looks for and follows straight lines. It does not follow a jagged path well, right? Your eye likes to follow a straight edge, right? So if you muck it with it a little bit, you can see where this one's not quite so, so, uh, so rough uh, as this edge here, right? And all I did was just monkey with the margins ever so slightly here to try to smooth that out a little bit, right? All right, full justification obviously gives you two straight edges, but be careful. Full justification does not work well with large font because it starts to put these giant gaps, okay, in there. And you also get what are called channels, where it almost looks like if you know, water could cascade through your font and follows. And sometimes it's not like here, this is a pretty strong channel here. Visually, it's a pretty strong channel. So beware of, of using full justification, great for newspapers, maybe not so much on your, on your slide, but it does create two nice 
uh, straight edges, which the eye likes to follow. Center justification is almost always bad. I can't think of why you'd use it, okay? Outside of a wedding invitation with a few lines of, of, of fancy script font, right? Because it gives you almost no straight edge, right? Uh, you get a ragged edge on both sides when you go to full justification, right? Whoops. Um, and then, uh, come on back. There we go. Uh, and then on, on the right edge, problem with right justification, although again, there are times, none of these are hard and fast rules. Don't, don't ever use it. I mean, there are times that I've used right justification, often with a companion, two column, with a companion piece on the left side. Um, I use one right, one left justified because I want the eye to follow the center, creates a center channel. Right? Because otherwise, again, if you're reading English, all right, then you're going to start uh, and you're going to want to read left to right. And you're going to want to start up. So you're going to want to start right here. And already your eye is being drawn down this way, uh, following a ragged edge. Not the best. By the way, avoid these guys. A handful of words that end up by themselves at the bottom of the line. These are widows. In the print word, when it gets kicked to another page, it's called an orphan. Right? Again, monkey with your text. Keep all your text together. Don't create these visual discontinuities for the eye to get distracted. Let's talk about fonts, right? There's basically two types, okay? We've got our fancy serif fonts and the serifs, and they all have clever names. If you get into these study font, all these little bits of a font have a name, but basically we're talking about these little feet, okay? All little feet, those are serifs, right? And the simple sans without, all right, serifs, okay? So fancy with serifs, sans without. Now, there are arguments about which is easier to read. All right, and then part of it, I think, depends on how you're using the font. One of the arguments uh, for uh, the use of distinguishing between when you use these two fonts is you use a fancy font for headings, you use simple uh, sans type of fonts like Arial, Gabriel, for um, the body. Now, some people will say, well, the reason that this is easier to read is the feet make a flat edge and it help the eye follow a line. Okay, potentially true on a printed page of a book, not when we're trying to work in a PowerPoint environment, where we're trying to use more visuals and less text to communicate. But pick two. Now, if you're gonna go this way, pick two. You get, a, you get a fancy one and a plain one, stop. That's it. Don't be bringing in third, fourth, and fifth font types uh, because you think it looks cool, right? All it does is introduce this sense of, uh, it lacks harmony, it lacks a professional sense of composition. Now, with color, likewise, we've talked about color about picking palettes. You don't need a ton of colors. Most designs will only focus on a handful of colors. I only picked two colors here, okay? This and this one, I'm sorry, this one. Now, I then took this one and I toned it, which means you make it lighter. And I took this one and I shaded it, which means you make it darker, and boom, I got four complementary colors that work together, and these are the only four I'm gonna use. Now you can start using those for other things to create contrast. Now, Danger Will Robinson. Here's one of the first mistakes people will make, right up here. Look what happens to fancy font. If you make fancy font lighter against a dark background, the worst case is typically Times New Roman against white Times New Roman against black. Your eye will, will not see these little thin bits, okay? They visually disappear. These little, the little thin parts up here, they start to disappear, okay? When you go with the, the, uh, the, Fancy fonts, which have got thick and thin parts, uh, and you try to go light on dark, all right? So again, but pick up the complement, all right? Some of these work out very quite very nicely. I get nice contracts by simply taking the base color and using that for my font against the one I created by just darkening it up a little bit. Same thing on this side here, all right? You can see here, you don't quite get the same kind of buzz. And by the way, that buzz, that's what I talked about scintillation. Um, if you put certain colors on top of each other in their purest sense, pure red on top of pure blue, pure red on top of pure green, it vibrates, right? And it's very disconcerting, right? Now you can fix that by looking at the, as you look at your color controls or something about, uh, there's a control called saturation. They tune it down. If you just turn down the saturation a little bit, you'll, you'll lose the buzziness of those colors on top of each other. PowerPoint has a grid. Turn it on, use it, line stuff up. This is not hard, okay? And yet people will try to eyeball it, right? when there are tools in a, in a PowerPoint that's called the align tools, align centers, align lefts, align middles, align tops, bottoms, uh, distribute horizontally. I watch people struggle to try to get things like things lined up across the slide. You go, dude, just select them all and pick distribute horizontally. Boom, PowerPoint will do it for you, okay? There are tools in there to help you with the placement of objects. Where you put things on a slide communicates information. 
Okay, we tend to associate things that are of a similar size, shape, proximity, and color as being related. Okay, size, shape, proximity, and color tends to, to convey to us that these things, quote, belong together. Use the grid to think about where you're putting things. And when we're talking about color, okay, this is a trick you can use. Go to your slide sorter, okay, and then just kind of go to slide sorter, make the slides as small as you can, and kind of sit back and look at the slide. And if it looks like a box of melted crayons, then you probably didn't have any sense of color palette when you were putting together the slide. Here, I look at this, I can tell what this author's color palette was. This is a nice way to check uh, on terms of, did, did you use color in some consistent manner? Will the brief of the presentation come off as a unified whole? This is a brief that, that I give uh, at the college again, and put it in this mode and you can see, I was in a, I was in a, in a burnt orange mood when I made this. It's all done in sepias and warm tones, uh, using more on the orange. There's a couple of tiny exceptions in there, which I did on purpose, right? But by and large, I tried to keep the same kind of color palette, and I use that same color when it comes to the font, when it came to the diagrams, to try to keep the sense that this is a single unified whole as a product, okay? You can tell when you get a Franken brief, okay? A Franken brief is where John made slides one, three, and five, Mary made slides two through nine, and there, there's a discontinuity in style, in color, in font, and you're gonna go, oh yeah, we, we didn't have time to clean it up. Well, then find the time, right? If you're gonna put something together, then again, you wanna put that best foot forward in terms of creating that seamless integration of information to allow a seamless presentation to your audience. By the way, slide sorter is a great way to use it as a storyboard. We shouldn't have called it slide sorter. It should have been called storyboard, okay? Because this is where you can sit there and look at your visuals and arrange them so it, quote, tells the story in a better order. It's what every film producer does when trying to put together a storyboard. Slide sorter is a storyboard. Okay? Now, back to that use of space. Okay? From a compositional perspective, you can divide uh, your slide into thirds. Okay? Top third, so you end up with nine boxes. Right? And these intersections are your focus areas for your visual that you're going to put on the slide. Right? Uh, your eye goes up and right, I'm sorry, up and left first. Zone one, this is where you put the most prized thing on the slide, okay? The best piece of information you're trying to communicate, this is where it goes. Because if your, view, if your audience looks nowhere else, they'll look here first and maybe last, okay? And then the eye, again, for folks who are trained to read from a left to right, the eye follows this lazy Z, okay? And by the time your eye gets down to zone four, this is what I call my burning tire pile of whatever, okay? Don't put anything important down there. Right. If you have to put something like, oh, you know, my bot, I got to put the company logo on every slide. Fine, stick it down there. Stick it in the burning tire pile. Okay. At least from a visual use of space, that's cheap real estate and not very valuable. Okay. The most bestest valuable spot on your slides are zone one and zone two, three, and four. Okay. That's the path your eye will naturally follow unless you do something spectacular with graphics to pull the eye in a different direction. That's the, that's the pattern, the natural pattern of reading. Right? So it's not dead center, by the way, okay? Being slightly off center over here is actually more visually appealing than being dead center on the slide. So we've kind of talked about, uh, you know, you've got, a, you've got tools to use when, when working with that real estate. When you see a slide, you should be thinking, I've got 75 square inches or, or a little bigger if you're working with, you know, 69 uh, landscape uh, aspect. Um, but you've got somewhere, you've got this real estate that you want to use to best effect. You need to think like a magazine page layout editor. How do I lay out the information on a magazine page to be most impactful and best used? By the way, when you thumb a magazine, there's a reason everything's on the outside edge. Because think of how you thumb a magazine. You don't see what's on the inside fold unless you stop and open the page. That's why I'm gonna put some eye-catching imagery on the outside edge as you thumb to get you then to pause and pull the magazine open further to see what's on the inside. Okay, this is understanding the mechanic of magazine reading, all right, about where you put imagery. Okay, likewise here, you've got the background to work with, you've got the colors, the images you choose, and the text itself all helps convey this sense of unified information. But you've got to be firmly wet in your mind, what am I using this for? Am I using it for the TED-like presentation, ballroom type stuff, where it's usually about big images, okay, briefly shown, that reinforce what the speaker is saying, reinforce 
what they're saying, not explain, reinforce, because I don't have time to study your slide. Or are we working with this intimate deck that we're passing around, we're gonna use it at a board meeting, we're gonna use this deck in a presentation to the company VPs here next week to get them to, uh, to buy off on a restructuring of the marketing department, okay? That's not a TED presentation. That's a much smaller intimate group and then you're working with slides that quite frankly, well, quite, you may have distributed ahead of time as part of a read ahead, quote unquote read ahead, right? So understand how your slides are getting used and don't cross purpose them. It doesn't work well as we've seen here. So in general, if I had to give you just some straightforward advice about how to make a slide and begin to approach a slide better. If you know you're in, you're likely to be in more of that presentation mode, okay? First of all, put all the text and bury it down in the notes section, right? By and large, I'm not gonna wanna read when I'm sitting there in the Astoria ballroom and I'm getting some presentation from the speaker, I'm looking, to, I'm there to listen, okay? And I want the visuals to reinforce what you're saying, but I'm not gonna read your slides, I can't because I have to stop listening to you. So, so try to avoid text-based slides when you're in the ballroom, okay? Any image you do have, make it big, make it bold. Fill the slide with that image, okay? And this is when you also figure out if your visual, because uh, I had a colleague and we sat through a brief he was giving and I said, boy, you know, why don't you just take all the text off, just say that, and then take your art and make it really big. And we made the art really big and went, oh, that kind of looks dopey, doesn't it? Uh-huh, because it wasn't, it was, it was visual eye candy, all right? It was just a little, something a little fun put on the slide. But when that becomes the only thing on the slide, you realize it's not adding value, okay? If you are gonna put words on the slide, keep it bumper sticker, make it, make it impactful, and make it be the big idea you want people to remember, okay? Now, here's the biggest thing. The slide is not your teleprompter. I can tell when a presenter doesn't know the material and they're actually waiting for the next slide to remember because there's this, has, there's this pause while they wait for the slide to come up and go, oh yeah, this is the part where I, where I talk about the marketing plan. You should know your presentation cold, know the rhythm of your presentation, I said that you can be moving through those things and not having to you look at the slide. There's a reason in TED environment, Okay, that if you're gonna use visuals, you never see the TED talker typically look over your shoulder to see what's up because there are monitors up, up in the upper right hand or uh, high in the corners of the, of the typical TED auditorium where they can see what's being projected behind them so they don't have to turn and look, okay? The slide is not your teleprompter. You, when you start using slides as teleprompters, it's like the equivalent of being back in high school when you had to put the notes for your talk on an index card that you tried to discreetly keep low right, you know, down in the palm of your hand or on the podium. You wouldn't sit there and go and make the index card be giant and hold it up for everyone to see. Look, I'm using an index card. That's what you're doing when you go with a text-based slide so you can remember what to say. You're simply showing the audience your index cards. If you're gonna be in the boardroom on the other hand, pyramid the information as much as possible. We've talked about that at length now. Uh, big ideas, supporting bits, smaller detail structured in a way that the eye pulls the big thing first. Two most relevant texts. I don't get any money for these, but I keep pushing them. Slideology, if you're gonna be going presentation, big presentation. Uh, speaking PowerPoint, if you're working more as PowerPoint has become kind of the ubiquitous business document for small teams to work together with. So, with that, I do want to remind people of a couple things here before we take our Q&A. So one is, let's see here, uh, a reminder that we have connections. All right, so connection starts next week. Uh, for those of you interested in wargaming, wargaming topics, um, obviously all virtual this year, uh, great opportunity. Uh, if otherwise you wouldn't be able to travel and spend the week at connections. Uh, the uh, I'll be talking at Connections, um, my days, and we talked about this in some of the earlier sessions. Um, the Pandemic Tempest, uh, is a, I present that on the first day, and it's a case study in looking at how we modified uh, a game design to make it more impactful, uh, to make it more engaging for the participants, it happened to be about a, a pandemic, and it was, and we like to say it was eerily quiescent, not really, if you'd done any reading, you could have anticipated kind of what we're living through right now if you'd done a bit of study. But I'm gonna talk about on that design of that game and how we modified that game uh, to, uh, to be more better, okay? Um, then later in the week, uh, talking about distributed gaming, obviously that's a big thing now because of COVID. Um, and uh, just very early on as we started getting into this idea of distributed gaming, it's nothing, it's not 
nothing new. Distributed gaming has been around since play by mail with people sending chess moves back and forth to each other. Um, but as it turns out that uh, when I say distributed gaming and when you say distributed gaming, there's a good chance we're not talking about the same thing. Um, and this has to be an active design consideration. There are some things that distributed gaming actually I think does better than face-to-face -face gaming, th things that doesn't do as well. But those are conscious design decisions. Um, and we'll talk about those. And there's going to be a, a panel discussion then on Friday that talks to that. So my Fast and Furious. And again, I didn't give you hard design rules. I didn't sit there and say, you know, don't, don't use bullets. or Well, actually, I said don't use bullets. Uh, but the idea is look at that thing. I, I know it's intimidating uh, when people say, well, uh, you know, the blank slide is just, I don't know where to start. If you're starting on PowerPoint, you're probably already putting the cart before the horse, okay? After you know what you want to say, come to PowerPoint and think about what you, what, how you want to say it. Nobody is making a film going, I don't know, I tried to start filming out here in the woods and I'll see what happens. No, I already have an idea what my script is. I already have an idea of the narrative I want to tell. That's what I bring then to my filming. That's what you need to bring to PowerPoint, that sense of I have a story to tell, I have information to convey. How can I do it in the most impactful, powerful way using the imagery that PowerPoint affords me and not simply club my audience over the head with text, okay? Basic principles. Um, I really, uh, again, and much of what I took away in terms of how I've been using PowerPoint over the last couple of years was driven by two books, Gabriel's and Duarte's. Uh, has been my most uh, my greatest influence on thinking about how I use this as a design medium. So this is the point where we kind of turn it over to questions. And, and really, there's, there's uh, uh, if you get a question, just you know unmute and chime in, and, and I'll see if I can address it. Uh, Pete, this is John Elliott, uh, CSO, and uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, it shows that the traditional rules, just as in art and composition, still apply. And the number one goal is effective communications. Uh, so as you know, we have to consolidate the demands of our superiors, which uh, oftentimes come from uh, backgrounds that don't have any communications savvy and or military backgrounds or ones that are enamored with military approaches. Um, so uh, we have a hybrid quite often in our presentations. I've been working in PowerPoint and Macromind Director before that since the uh, late 80s. Uh, and I have my druthers, I have my preferences, but oftentimes we have to massage it. Um, so, uh, do you, you mentioned these books, these uh, sort of uh, primers at the beginning, which I think is great. I'm going to check them all out. I, I wasn't familiar with those, but uh, this presentation that we just did, uh, is there an encapsulated uh, five minute version of it on YouTube or have you produced anything that uh, is something that a typical uh, front office principal might have time to look at just so we can avoid further confrontations or, or challenges? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the, the, the raw quickie one. Um, but what I have done on occasion is, and again, it, it, you gotta, you got to figure out your audience's tolerance for disobedience. Um, in terms of jumping in it, and uh, I know there's, especially in the military environment, right? There's everyone wants to pre-approve and screen and look at your PowerPoints. And once it's on PowerPoint, it's, you know, doubt shall not change it kind of thing. Whereas I've tried to basically um, not, if I can avoid the pre-screen and just make the PowerPoint the way I want to make it and present it that way and have people say, oh, actually that was, that was, uh, that was effective, that was pretty good. As opposed to saying, hey, would you mind if I do it this way and ask permission? And I know, again, I, we're not always in a situation where, where you've got that luxury. Um, I remember fact, I have a colleague who got adamant about it. Um, and again, was in the position to be able to stomp out of the room and, and take his, his toys and go home, when he was told that, well, your presentation to the general um, will consist of no more than slides uh, and you know, it had other structure. And he said, well, no, if I need more than five slides, I'll use more than five slides. If I need to use one slide, I may use no slides. I don't know, but how I communicate this 
is up to me to determine, not you. Well, no, that's not the way to do things around here. Well, then I guess I'm not going to share my information. And, but good, again, he was in a position where he had the luxury of being able to walk out of the office. Um, there's not too many times where you get to do that and just say, nah, then I'm not going to play if I can't present the way I think I can most effectively present. Um, some people have tried to get double duty out of PowerPoint uh, in terms of, and I want to say this was, was this Stavridis? Um, this is what I called publishing by PowerPoint, where what they would do is they would take the notes format of PowerPoint. And remember, you can modify all the templates, right? So basically, they took the notes template and they would put down under the notes full English text, you know, full declarative text, uh, meant to be read. And then above it was the image that was projected. So that whenever the admiral went on the road, he would show the big image and just talk to it because he knew his material. And if someone wanted the printed version of that, then they would just, they wouldn't print the slides, they would print the notes pages, which then conveyed the imagery that he had used and all the explanatory text underneath. And you have to monkey around to get it to, you know, to get it to format correctly. But again, you, you can do that. But yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't have the quickie version to compel people. And, and what I find it frustrating, especially after the, the Afghan PowerPoint fiasco, was when people say, oh, PowerPoint's taken over the military, we hate it, but there's nothing we can do about it. Really, there's nothing you can do about it. I, I find that disingenuous. You know, I, in terms of either senior leadership not saying, uh, I, I don't want this, uh, and either then saying, I'm not going to, I'm not going to prescribe a format because they think that somehow they're making it easier. Right? Prescribe, this is the commands template. This is the way we do it. It'll make it easier for you because you don't have to think about how you present the information. This is really, you don't want me to think about how I present the information. You wouldn't you want me to think about how I present this information so I can present it in the most compelling, clear, concise manner to convey my point. So part of this is the willingness to put in the time. I mean, I, I joke on my front slide though, that says this takes time. And when you first start to do this, you're gonna find that it takes you three times as long to put together the briefs. What's the, what's the, uh, the famous quote there in terms of, if you wanted me to be uh, briefer in my remarks, you would have had to give me more time to prepare because brevity and clarity and conciseness takes time to hone. So, I mean, you do enough of it, you get better, <laughs> right? I can do this stuff fairly quick now because I've been doing this for years, but unfortunately I don't have the quickie answer to convince people that no, you really don't want a PowerPoint full of bullets. Anything else? Hi, um, this is Katie Donahue. Thanks a lot. This was really informative and super helpful. Um, but just to, was, you have this recorded and um, I was, was just wondering if you could revisit that icon primer, like what the, the address of that was, mm -hmm. so we could, we could um, yep. uh, use yep. that. It's called, yeah, it's called then, yeah, you'll be able to see, we'll post it once we get it uh, down uh, from the cloud and, you know, we'll, we'll post and send out the link, but that's called the noun project nounproject.com, uh, or I, think, I don't think it was with the, it's just nounproject.com. But one of the things that now, like I said, it comes with the latest edition with PowerPoint is a whole built-in uh, collection of icons that are easy then also to change the color of the icon uh, by simply picking a color. Um, and, you know, you can sort on, you can say, you know, search on people, search on medical, search, you pick your topic and it'll throw up a bunch of icons for you to potentially use. Um, you can almost create one of the techniques that's in one of the books. I want to say it's in I'm not sure which one, it's either in Bruce or in Nancy's books, is this idea about how to make your own icons. Uh, to, to, and really, um, a simple drawing uh, reduced to lines, put against a, a round color background, and you use the same round shape for all of them. That shape and color instantly puts the icons in my brain into a family. It's, it's color, shape, proximity, and size the things that your brain wants to associate together. So when you're trying to create that uniform set of images that are all of the same style, that's one of the thing, first things you can do is simply take what otherwise would look to be a somewhat disparate images if they were appearing by themselves and back them on a common shape with a common color. And already the AI starts to think that they belong together and they don't just look like random clip art. And that's already embedded in all the software, the PowerPoint software? Yep, the latest version. Um, I didn't notice, I, I don't know what, which version 365, I kind of lost track now that they kind of, you know, the 365-ing of, of the Microsoft products. But um, you'll know you have it is if you go to the place where normally it just says, like you go and it says, you know, insert pictures. Mm -hmm. 
the insert picture is a whole little sub menu that says insert a picture, insert a shape, insert an icon. That's how you know you got the latest that version. Okay. Thank you. Yep. One other question. This is Katie again. Is yeah. there a, um, a standard length? I know you talked about the quad charts and how that's really not that effective and tends to be too busy. But yeah. you know, sometimes these these PowerPoints can be you know thirty page, thirty thirty slides or, or like. I mean, is there a sweet spot that you've learned over the years that really um, are you know drives home the the point? but provides enough background and, you know, and recommendations without, without it being overkill. Yeah. So it depends on your format, whether we're talking ballroom or talking boardroom. Nancy Duarte likes to tell a story about ballroom where she was invited to speak um, at, and I can't remember if she was, you know, like the before dinner speaker, to the speaker but they told her she had approximately uh, like 30 minutes to speak. And she says, great. I got it. Uh, it says, oh, and could you send your slides and materials in in advance that we can have everything loaded? Sure, she did that. And they, she sent in her slide deck. And when she got to the venue, they said, oh, my goodness, we, we had to cut your slide deck. She's like, what are you talking about? Well, you had 124 slides. He goes, yes, I have 124 slides. It presents in 30 minutes. So what did you do? Well, we used the rule, you know, a minute per slide. So we cut the majority of your slides. She says, really? Interesting. Because now I'll probably have about three minutes to which to talk and you'll have to figure out what to do with the other 27. This idea that from the ballroom perspective, a certain number of slides somehow equates to time all depends on how you're using your slides. And Nancy used slides in where like they would be like six images in rapid fire, pow, 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 pow. And they would arc across the screen in a way to pull people's eyes. I mean, she has complete control of her visual medium and the number of slides is somewhat meaningless. Contrast that with boardroom situation, okay, where you're trying to use that almost like a book. You know, it, it's, it's like any other printed document where people have to absorb it. Uh, and then you got to get into the, well, okay, so what is it that I, how much time do I think my reader can devote to looking at this? And is this the infamous executive who apparently has time, precious time, precious little time for anything? And, you know, this is the, the, the equivalent of the executive summary, if you were to use Word. Uh, or a point paper, if you were again using Word, then you're going to have to keep this thing. Um, what they did, the, the company that Bruce will talk about, I'm going to say it was the old uh, uh, Marietta before they got merged. Um, Marietta, uh, their rule for that type of deck was each department, each big idea got one page. That way the reader knew that this page was focused on the engineering proposal. This page is focused on the marketing plan. This page is focused on contract relations or whatever, all right? So one big idea per page, and that was it. So how many big ideas do you have to communicate? You should kind of drive the length of your deck. Um, and again, think about most readers, most casual readers, I'd offer 20 minutes is a long time, okay? For someone to read a material uh, in preparation for going into a meeting. I don't know why, but so then you, then you start to look at your stuff and if, and if you read it to yourself and you look at your material, you give it to a colleague to say, look over this and, and try to make a, a note about how long it takes you to go through it. Whether it's two slides or 200 slides, if it's less than 20 minutes, you're probably okay. One slide, one big idea, how many big ideas you're trying to communicate. Um, Steve Ballmer tells a story where he used to think that he liked people leading him to the conclusion. Okay, T walk me through your thinking and then bring me to the conclusion. Um, he said after he was at the company for, for less than a year, he said, yeah, I hate that, okay? <laughs> That's when he started doing the, no, tell me right up front what your big idea is. And if I've got a problem with it, then we can discuss. But if I'm on board, we just saved ourselves half hour. Big idea up front. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, see, unfortunately, there's just no hard and fast rules. Okay, I'm not going to twist arms. Um, again, we I had just one question for you, Pete. Oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Robert. It was about uh, 
using PowerPoint um, with wargaming, possibly for making maps or or tokens. I just wonder if you had any suggestions for its use in that area. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so how much time do we have? Let me let me see if I can show you something real quick. I gotta find it. All right, let me, let me try this. I'm off on my desktop here for just a moment. Uh, what I'm looking for. Uh, yes, so I've, I've used it. I've used it extensively um, for um, for uh, maps. As a matter of fact, the latest version of PowerPoint has a moving map function. They don't call it that, but that's what it is. Um, okay, so here we go. All right, so. What we're going to do is I'm going to share my desktop and hopefully this will work. Uh, it's about three minutes. Mm -hmm. This is all powerful. will make will make a movie out of itself okay if you provide the narration and soundtrack and whatnot um pete i think you were playing the mp4 instead of the powerpoint oh is that what it was doing i think so um so the um the the brief it's oh actually anywhere else rather than trying to play the mp4 yeah let me show you the powerpoint um okay see this is what happens when i go, when I go off script All right, here we go. Let's try. Now it's not liking this. Um, basically, what I did was so, um, and I, I'll put this up when we uh, when we put up the links. So, PowerPoint now has a transition mode called Morph. So you know, your transitions are what what it does going from one slide to another. And usually, I don't use much in the way of transition. Um, I like push. Push gives the sense that I'm moving through a film strip. I'm moving sort of like the, if you remember, if you're familiar with the presentation software Prezi, um, push can be used to kind of create that sense of motion inside of your brief, rather than rather than the the, the flash and the slide kind of thing. Also, it squashes the tendency to say next slide. By the way, one of the worst things you can do is say next slide. I, and I know in situations where you don't have control over your slides, it's difficult to do anything. But um, however, next slide crushes all sense of flow, okay, and and causes your brief to be chunked into these snap pieces and it has no flow. You have to stop and go next slide. Anyways, um, but the transition called morph. Morph will take what was, and it'll, it'll look at the previous slide, look at your next slide, and if the same shape is present in the second slide, as it was in the first slide, but in a different position and a different size, PowerPoint will handle the animation for you. And it'll automatically grow it, shrink it, do whatever it needs to do to transition it from the where it was on slide one to where you have it on slide two. In the past, you would have had to spend a bunch of time with animation techniques going, okay, so I need to make it move, try to put down the motion path and never quite goes where you want it to go. And at the same time, you wanted to get bigger and then you didn't have control. You don't have to do any of that. So from a wargaming perspective, what I was able to do was I just used a big PowerPoint. And remember, you can resize PowerPoint to any scale you want, okay? My PowerPoint scaled out at uh, 24 by 48 inches. Yeah, you just tell it, that's how big I want you to be. All right, uh, and then I had a bunch of, of icons, pucks, right? As, as, as the kids were moving, I was moving the pucks around. So I'd have a slide, turn one, right? Here's where all the pucks are, all right? Uh, slide, turn two, I just make a copy of slide one, copy it, now it's slide two, move the pucks to the new position. 
using the morph transition between slides one to two, two to three, three to four, four to five, all the pucks would magically move by themselves when I ran the PowerPoint show. And I didn't have to do any of the animation. All I had to do was just update the position of the forces. Right? There are some clever tricks you can use with PowerPoint um, in a wargaming environment. One of the other ones is this idea that you can make PowerPoint to a distant user look like it's dynamic. You know, one of the things that's difficult to do without plugins and special software is to edit PowerPoint, to use editing tools while it's in present mode. Because it's like, well, where am I? Am I editing or am I PowerPoint? Am I you know, presenting or am I editing? But say you want to draw on the screen. I mean, I have a drawing tablet. But say you want to draw on the screen, you want to manipulate the objects on the screen. PowerPoint doesn't really like you to do that. There are ways to kind of trick it to do that. But one of the things that you can do is if you embed PowerPoint in something else, another Microsoft product, okay, it doesn't matter what it is. This is almost just like a stunt part of it in terms of I, I've used Excel for this, where I just take Excel and I embed the PowerPoint presentation in Excel. Just embed object PowerPoint. Boom, there it is. Make it big, make it fill the screen. No one would know that they're in Excel other than the fact that if you look in the top edge and it's got that green stripe for Excel. Now, uh, that's a shared file. Meanwhile, on a separate computer, I am dynamically, I'm in edit mode and I'm updating that file. And I'm changing stuff and I'm dragging icons onto the map, off of the map and whatnot. All the user sees are icons appearing and moving. And it looks like it's a dynamic picture. So lots of tricks you can do with PowerPoint um, to be able to use it for moving map displays uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and part of it is just kind of exploring, kind of pushing the, the software and seeing what you can, what you can get out of it. Um, but yes, that, that's the part of the, one of the biggest things I've used it for is, um, and, and we've done it at the college. Sometimes we joke about how sometimes I can have this complicated Google Earth based icons and this map for a bet or I can put the whole thing on PowerPoint and just drag little circles around that say carrier destroyer in the fifth core and drag them around the map. And in some ways, that's more effective uh, than it is trying to do it in Google Earth. Uh, Pete, I know this is about PowerPoint, but do you yeah. care to opine about uh, Prezi or uh, Keynote? Yeah, so I'm not as familiar with Keynote. Prezi, I've worked uh, quite a bit with. And um, Prezi, I, I've gone back and forth on Prezi. Um, I haven't played with it recently to look at some of its uh, its improvements. I, what I like about Prezi, and PowerPoint's been trying to get more Prezi-esque. What I like about Prezi is this sense of um, breaking up and getting out of the image, 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 image tr uh, train that is PowerPoint, okay? This, the trail of slides. Um, because in, unless you consciously are working to make that seem more seamless, then the default structure of PowerPoint tends to make you chunk your story and not tell a smooth story. Prezi, on the other hand, comes at it from the exact 180 out, right? In terms of it starts with a great big canvas, um, and this single canvas is where you're going to construct your story. Now, some people find the spinning and moving through Prezi disorienting and difficult to follow, uh, and they're more comfortable kind of with the film strip approach of, of PowerPoint. I like them both. I've used them both for different occasions. And I think part of what drives my decision between the two is just how complex am I about to get? Um, I don't know if you've seen, oh, there's a, there's a British company that um, does uh, the, the hand drawing uh, pictures over a narration. And usually it's done in post-production. So someone has narrated a story about public education in the United Kingdom, for example. Uh, and then an artist listens to that story, storyboards it out as a series of pictures he draws, and then he starts drawing. And you watch a hand, Chris, it's slightly sped up, right, to keep pace with a spoken word. But he draws these images, and he draws like on a long scroll. And by the time you're done, you can pull back and get the entire story on one great big canvas. Um, Watching people draw images is really powerful uh, and is an interesting way to communicate. Um, I did this as part of a contractual uh, presentation for the government uh, years ago when we were competing for some, my company was competing for, you know, for a bid. And what we had was at one point in the presentation, I was standing there in front of the government panel with a blank piece of butcher paper and a black magic marker. And I was describing how our company would go about organizing and approaching to deliver on the problem that we've been given as part of this presentation. And in the end, um, I had filled the butcher block with this diagram. And during one of the breaks, one of the people came up to me and said, wow, how, 
how did you get everything to fit so nicely? I didn't want to say, well, if you look closely, I had drawn the entire thing ahead of time in pencil. You just couldn't see it. <laughs> and I was just going over the lines. The point is that seeing something grow before your eyes and have the complexity added is a powerful way for people to be able to understand as opposed to showing you a schematic. I show you a wire diagram all at once and your brain, just like the spaghetti diagram from Afghanistan, your brain overloads. I draw that and sometimes Prezi can kind of give that, so that impression. I draw that part at a time, piece at a time, piece at a time, and explain each piece and then let you look at the whole, you can grasp it more. So I think part of it goes to the complexity of the material I'm trying to present on whether I think a Prezi environment um, will, will work well or whether or not uh, PowerPoint. So I tend to be a little bit more flexible. And I think part of it is just what you're comfortable with. Um, and I'm really comfortable with PowerPoint, um, but I have used Prezi. So yeah, that's kind of, I, I, I enjoy that, 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 that free open canvas. And a lot of times I spend making, trying to make PowerPoint behave like that open canvas. Okay, there's nothing more. We're towards the bottom of our hour. So again, I extol you to tell good stories and use pictures to tell them. Keep thinking about that old slide tray. And nobody was writing words on top of their family vacation slides. They were just showing Bob and Susan and George and Andrew and telling a story. Rob? Oh, well, thank you very much, Pete. We really appreciate it. Uh, and just a reminder for folks, <clears throat> these will be on the same site, right? That you've had your other presentations on? Yep, everything goes up in the same place. I would, it's one-stop shopping. Yes, so you'll also have a chance to uh, see some of the, uh, the slides of the previous uh, presentations as well. Okay, and with that, folks, if you're on the East Coast, try to stay dry. And uh, we'll see you next time we come up with a topic. We'll let you know uh, when we get around to doing another one of these. Hey, uh, and again, I extol everybody, if you've got that interest in wargaming, Connections this year is a great way to drop in and sample the waters. So with that, goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You.